podcast? No. Oh. What do we call the series all? again? Yeah, it's filming. What's up, everyone? <laughs> Jimmy from MTB Travel Review here, and welcome back to episode four. This episode, this is four. Four. This is episode four. <laughs> Stupid simple bike this chat. The fourth one. This, this that's the third. The series is exactly what it sounds like. It's taking sometimes overly complex bike subjects and just giving you the brass tacks, breaking everything down, very beginner oriented. Let's all learn about bikes together. With me is Matt Nicholas, one of the owners of Bootlegger Bikes here in Jeffersonville, Vermont. I am an enduro cyclist. I ride my bike a lot, not an engineer. Matt's an engineer, he's a little smarter than me, so we make a good team. On today's episode, we are going to talk about dropper posts. <laughs> so back in the day when, when I first started mountain biking, dropper posts weren't really a thing. You had what was considered a rigid post. Literally just a metal rod that held your seat up. Worked really well in the beginning, but eventually we realized that to be more nimble on a bike, to be able to ride rougher trails, to be able to move around and just get the seat out of your way, it would be very beneficial to have a post that could literally move up and down in and out of your way when riding. I remember when I started riding, it was like, if anything was super steep, you had to tuck your seat in your gut. And then if it didn't work out, you just got a seat nailed in your gut. Or, and or it, inevitably your shorts would catch the seat yeah. when you went to get back yeah. on the yeah. saddle. It was a different kind of riding. But now we have dropper posts. So what is a dropper post? <laughs> Literally think about an office chair, right? When you're spinning around in an office chair, pretending you're working, you push the little lever on the bottom. If you take your weight off of the seat, the seat will actually raise itself. If you put weight on the seat and pull that same lever, the seat lowers itself. So long story short, it's a super fancy technical pneumatic device, right? Is that how it you is. say it? Yeah. It's, it's basically sure. a pressurized chamber inside, right? That when you activate it, it releases and forces the post up. It is, exactly. Internally, there is simply uh, an air chamber on most droppers that is pressurized. And uh, as you alluded to, it's like an office chair. So when you push the button, it goes up. Um, and when you push the button and wait it, it goes down. Yeah. Uh, Super simple, but highly effective. I couldn't agree more. I think it's probably one of the most valuable advancements in, in mountain biking in many years. I put it right up there with, with tubeless tires, which we just covered. I mean, it's, one of, it's, it's an absolute game changer. And I think RockShock, the reverb, was like the first like on the map dropper post that's kind of where it all started and then you know for maybe the fat you know for the first like six seven years droppers were pretty bad like <laughs> didn't function when you needed them to they would freeze all sorts of mechanical failures but really like in the last three years right that's when they hit this stride and really started being much more effective and, and now it's it's honestly hard to find a bad dropper post out there yeah so droppers have come a long way in the last 10 years or so now they tend to work really well and again the goal with the dropper post is that you can have your seat up for pedaling efficiency, you want your legs to be a little longer to make sure you're as efficient as possible when pedaling. And then when you go into something a little gnarlier, when you need to get that seat out of the way, you put that seat down, hammer a gnarly section, you can tuck your stom stomach back really low. Again, it's just, some people like to ride in the middle too. So if it's a middle terrain, you can actually leave the dropper kind of in the middle setting. So you have some pedaling efficiency, but it's not as much in your way. So. Highly effective tool. It's funny because when you start using one, you don't realize how much you're going to use it. But now it's just that left thumb is kind of always moving and your dropper is always moving up and down. Yeah, they, you know, getting the saddle out of the way on technical descents, you know, even some technical traversing or flat terrain in that middle position that, yeah. that Jimmy alluded to, I find both of those positions very beneficial. And then of course, when you're climbing, you need to get that efficiency back. You need your leg to be near fully extended. So getting the saddle back up at the push of a button. You can also uh, open beers with it. <laughs> you can launch things off of them if you set them super fast. So there's also, there's all sorts of uses here. Now, as far as the differences between dropper posts, again, for the most part, the internal components, you don't really have to worry about, right? You do have to service them regularly, but like for me, I, I give it to Matt at the shop because he's the expert and that's what he does. The, the first thing you're gonna look for in a dropper post, so the first major difference is going to be the travel, okay? So how much does a dropper post move up or down? And your goal really depends on you. It depends on your legs, it depends on the style of riding that you're doing. 
Uh, for me, I'm a taller rider, right? So I want a longer travel post so that with my long legs, I can be up in a strong pedaling position. And then I can drop that way down and get it out of the way because I am taller. So I tend to have to get lower on my bike to really get my center of gravity down. So at this point, I think droppers go from what? 50 millimeters of travel to like 200 yeah. I mean, you know, generally for mountain bike, you'll find that droppers are anywhere, for an adult, anywhere between 100 and 200 millimeters. Yeah. Uh, you'd certainly get south of 100 for uh, young or shorter riders on full suspension bikes. Uh, and gravel bikes are now, you know, yeah. coming equipped with droppers, which are in the 50 millimeter range. Yeah, so there's a big range. Obviously, a lot of people are pushing for, for more travel, right? More of that seat you can make disappear because, again, it's out of your way. So it just makes life a lot easier. Another big difference from the droppers, and one thing that may not really matter to you, but there's basically three different ways that a dropper is actuated. And when I say actuated, three different ways that you make the seat go up and down. One is going to be cable actuated, where there is a lever on your bar. A cable runs from that lever to the seat post, push the lever, makes the seat post go up and down. Super simple. The second one, a little lesser used these days, I think is hydraulic, right? So that's a cable, same thing, runs from the lever down to the post, but it has actually a hydraulic fluid in it, right? Yeah. It's a hose that runs, yeah, it's a closed loop system like a, like a hydraulic brake. Yeah, so for me, I, I don't really mess with the hydraulics. There's just more that can go wrong. I don't know if you've ever accidentally bled your brake, your hydraulic brakes, but once the hydraulic fluid is out, you can't fix it trail side. So I tend to lean more towards cable actuated. And then now we have uh, the new world, this robotic world where we have electric droppers, right? I mean, they're like a gajillion dollars, but you can literally have a, yeah, a Bluetooth lever that raises and lowers your seats. Again, out of my price range, but those are the three major differences as far as how the dropper is moved up and down. Another big difference is going to be the routing. So as you know, on most mountain bikes, there's a lot of cables. There's cables everywhere. So one of the goals over the last you know four or five years, I think, is to keep hiding those cables, right? Running them inside the frame as opposed to having the cables all over outside of your frame getting snagged on things. So from what I understand, there's internal routing where the cable actually comes from the bottom. It's inside the bike, runs through the bike all the way up to the lever, That's right? right. <laughs> and then there's, what's the other version? Externally routed, which is something that is is typically an aftermarket product, just because it's employed on on older bikes that aren't equipped with internal routing. So you can still get the benefits out of a dropper, even if you don't have internal routing on your bike. It just means that the cable running from the remote or the lever to the dropper is all external, uh, much like an externally routed brake lever, yeah. cable or hose. Yeah. So you find a way to just run it along your frame. Yeah still serves the same purpose. Like he said, most bikes now come with droppers. They're gonna have the internal routing channels, keeps it all clean, keeps the cables out of the way. If you have an older bike or you're adding a dropper to an older bike, you'll likely have to use the external routing. So now that we've covered all of the basics of a dropper post, what they are, use education. Well, let's, let's talk use education. Everybody should have a dropper post <laughs> on, on every bike. But I, I don't, I, prove me wrong, whether it's a gravel bike or a fat bike, even a road bike, the only negative to a dropper post is the extra weight, right? Yeah, I mean, there's some extra weight there that's debatable as to whether or not it's an issue on a mountain bike. Once you start getting into lighter gravel bikes and, and road bikes, some of the weight weenies per se might yeah. frown upon it. Uh, but, but there's definitely a use for droppers on gravel bikes. It's just a good option to have, I think. You know what I mean? If, if it's too heavy, just be stronger. That's that's my motto. Not everyone's gonna agree with that, but. One less beer. Yeah. <laughs> One less beer and you can, you can manhandle a dropper, no problem. At the end of the day, a, a dropper can pretty much work on any bike. It depends how you're using the bike and what your preference is, but they're definitely a benefit. Much like everything else in mountain biking though, cost is usually the biggest hurdle. So let's talk about how much dropper posts cost. From what I understand, and, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, because you see more numbers than I do. Most base level droppers, like, Dropper you can get for any bike, it might last a little while, it's gonna get the job done, but you're probably gonna need to upgrade. That's like, what, a 50 to $100 range? You're probably looking closer to 100, just with the continued increase in the price of everything, but yeah. uh, especially bike bike components and bike equipment. So I would say, you know, 100 bucks. Yeah, and um, then, you know, the mid-tier, right? So that's like the, the Fox transfer, the P&W loan post, like, 
what we're talking about, like 150 to 300. Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, your moderately priced dropper is, yeah, 175, 200 bucks. Yeah, yeah. And, and those then, are, I mean, reliable. It'll get the job done for sure. Yeah, like, the, you know, this one up, I think, uh, is it's now 220 so it is it is getting a little more on the expensive side but extremely well equipped reasonably priced dropper awesome dropper yeah and then you have like the elite tier right and that's more of the like bluetooth is it shram who has the shram's got a an electronic actuated dropper and magura both do uh there might be there might be some others out there yeah. But they're like but those are six eight hundred bucks those are those are getting yeah, yeah. extremely expensive <laughs> yeah there are a lot of good droppers out there so pnw loam is what i run what do you run on your bike one up one up one up, one up make really good droppers fox transfer is like the go-to they are a little pricey i think they're upwards of like 350. yeah but they're pretty bulletproof so yeah there's a lot of good options out there do your research there are different you know diameter and mm -hmm. specifications i urge you if you're going to get a dropper post Talk to somebody like Matt. Talk to somebody at a bike shop that knows what they're talking about because every bike has different internal depths and diameters and I'm not an expert on it. You'll rarely have to change your dropper and that's why bike shops are key because these are the experts. They can tell you everything you need to know. How do we finish this one out? I feel like it's kind of a shoe in Like there's no downside to a dropper outside of the weight. Just get a dropper because it's 20, dropper. 2022. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. Again, it's basically like a super sweet office chair for your bike. It makes things 10 times better in my opinion. I've had a dropper for a long time, I've never looked back. So if you haven't tried one, try a buddy's bike, go get a demo, try out a dropper. I assure you, you will buy one soon. Thanks for following along. If you have any questions, comments, leave them below. If you have any recommendations for future videos, let us know. We're gonna be hanging a bunch, wanna cover more topics, and we appreciate the support. Keep riding, guys. New to this, that, I don't, you know what I mean? Together. Dropper posts. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't do that again.